Okay, welcome back everyone to our, the second part of our session on air quality modeling for health and regulatory assessments. Uh, so again, this is a session that tries to uh, sort of bridge a lot of the under the hood technical algorithmic things about aerosols with some of the more applied uh, work that we do in the spirit of the IAMA conference as, as Sarika explained this morning. Uh, in this second uh, part of the session, we have four more talks. Um, one will be about reactive oxygen species um, that are uh, related to uh, atmospheric particulate matter, and this gets into sort of oxidative stress and adverse health effects associated with PM. Uh, there's two talks about reactive organic carbon, um, one related to uh, emissions from residential wood combustion, and that's an important sector that um, folks want to control, and one related to uh, wildfire plumes, which is also important for um, informing air quality management uh, as well as exposure. Uh, and we also have a, a talk that's oriented to uh, roadside exposures of, of ultron particles. Um, so our first speaker is Dr. Manabu uh, uh, Shirawa, Shirawa uh, and he'll be talking about uh, formation of reactive oxygen species. Um, Dr. Shirawa is a professor uh, in chemistry at the University of California, Irvine. He received BS and MS uh, degrees from the University of Tokyo and a PhD from the Max Planck Institute for Chemistry in 2011. Uh, and he also worked as a group leader at the Max Planck Institute for Chemistry uh, and a postdoctoral fellow at, at Caltech. So um, let's welcome our first speaker. All right, thanks for kind interaction and then uh, thanks to organizer for giving me the opportunity to talk about uh, formation of reactive oxygen species by atmospheric particulate matter. So the, the starting from the really big picture is the health effects of air pollution that uh, particulate matter concentration can be very high in the polluted air and uh, people die because of that, right? So um, like 4.2 million people die per year this was an estimate in 2017. The latest estimate is almost 6 million. So the later the year is, more people are dying, it seems. <laughs> but so, so basically that the air pollution um, is really uh, um, um, harmful. And, and the big question we have is, are we creating a hazardous atmosphere? And the answer seems to be yes. Um, so the motivation is that air pollution is a threat to human health, but um, what is the underlying mechanism um, why air pollution is bad, bad for your health. And uh, one plausible hypothesis is that reactive oxygen species, ROS, uh, play a central role on that. So reactive oxygen species is an umbrella term, including something reactive, oxygen and species, namely like ozone, OH, superoxide, RO2 radicals. So these are the, the umbrella term for, for ROS. And we know as atmospheric chemists that ROS plays a very important role in the atmosphere. Um, it's generated by photochemistry, combustion, and it has uh, lots of impacts, oxidation and uh, cleansing of atmosphere and aging of organic aerosols. So we know that it plays a role in atmosphere. On the other side, we also know that ROS is very important for our human body. So it plays an important role for physiological processes. It's generated by inflammation, metabolism, and it has effects on cell signaling and regulation. So we do need ROS in our body uh, to be alive. Uh, but then if we have too much of it, then it can cause so-called oxidative stress. So the point is, is ROS processes in the atmosphere and the physiology is coupled at the interface. So interface of atmosphere and human body, uh, namely lung. Okay, so, so the, the goal of our study is that we try to have a quantitative understanding of ROS multiphase chemistry in lung uh, for their assessment and handling of air quality and public health. So ROS uh, can be generated by atmospheric particulate matter. And uh, we have been studying this process um, since quite a while now that, uh, for example, we found that secondary organic aerosols um, contain some reactive compounds such as um, organic hydroperoxide, ROH, and then this compound is not very stable and it may be decomposed to form OH radicals, RO radicals, and that may cause um, oxidative stress if you inhale them. And atmospheric PM also contain some other reactive or reverse active components, including quinones, environmental press persistent free radicals, this is a radicals that's stable, um, contained in, in, in particles, transition metals, humic like substances, they are levels active, and they may trigger the formation of ROS once it's inhaled in lung. So that, if you inhale such components in lung, our lung is covered by lung lining fluid, 
to protect our cells from, from these pollutants. And then that lung contains ascorbate, for example, this antioxidants. The point is that this ascorbate, that the electron transfer reaction can happen, and then it generates some reduced component that can react with oxygen, and then that can react, lead to the formation of superoxide, H2O2, and OH, and then that may cause so called oxidative stress. Okay, so, so there may be a chem chem chemistry happens in the lung, and then that can cause oxidative stress, but also in our body, we have cells. And then macrophages is a possible respondent that. Uh, um, that think, oh, if you inhale particles, oh, this is not good. So they try to eat it and release ROS and try to kill it. So there's also a similar process to, to uh, generate ROS. And then we try to compare the relative importance of these two processes. So the, the research we do is, um, I want to start from lab experiments that uh, we are looking into, we are, we are interested in ROS formation of second row ionic aerosols because we're interested in SOA health effects. So we can generate SOA using pump chamber, reaction chamber in the lab. And uh, what we do is we analyze, uh, we extract these particles into water and they analyze it with electron paramagnetic resonance spectroscopy. That can detect particles. Okay, this is a modeling conference, so I don't want to go into detail of experiments, but we can detect particles. Okay, so, so, so that's the method. And then we can model that. We try to model. So we detect some particles and then we try to understand what is the mechanism, what is the kinetics, what is the late constant that drives this formation of ROS. So we develop a method, uh, we develop a kinetic model that includes one hydroperoxide chemistry, pentolite chemistry, hot scuffling reaction, and also in the experiments, we use spin trapping agent BMPO, so we also treat that chemistry. And then we use Monte Carlo genetic algorithm developed by Thomas Berkemeyer, and that can efficiently uh, um, make a model fit to the experimental data. So this shows an example of that. We did experiment, we generate SOA, and then we extract in water, and we found that OH radicals are generated, for example, in this, in this spot. And if we add iron to the system, the formation of OH is enhanced. Okay, so that's experiments, the markers experiments, and this shading with lines are the model results. So the model can uh, reproduce experiments very well by considering this reaction. So the SOA contains organic hydroperoxide, um, that may be thermally decomposed to generate a weight, or it might interact with iron ion, which is phantom like reactions, and that can cause the formation of weight radicals. And then by implementing this reaction mechanism in the model, we can, we can explain it well. We went further step more step and we did more experiments and we found not just only OH radicals, but also superoxide is generated by secondary organic aerosols. And so this is the experiment that we this great formation, a different um, SOA, alpha propinyl isoprene, beta pinene d diamond SOA. This shows uh, the formation of superoxide, O2 minus. Okay. And so, so this is experiments, I mean, we, we hypothesize the chemistry, okay, so that, okay, we think that those organic hydroperoxides are generated by formation of hydrogen, um, um, by auto-oxidation, um, and then that can partition into, into the, the water phase, and then that goes to uh, decomposition leads to the formation of waste radicals that can may react with alcohol, and then that leads to the formation of hydroxyl peroxide radicals that may decompose to form O2 minus. Okay, so, so if we implement this mechanism, we can explain um, uh, the observed um, um, kinetics. So we think this is a, the plausible uh, um, um, pathway for the ROS formation. But another evidence of that uh, organic hydroperoxide is most likely the source of ROS is that we see that the big effect by NOx. That means that when we introduce NOx, when we generate SOA, then we see that the ROS formation is significantly reduced, as you can see in, in this figure. And a mass spec shows that um, in the presence of NOx, that RO2 radicals, instead of reacting with HO2 to form ROH, it actually reacts with NOx to form organic nitrates. And that can be supported by gecko A modeling that in the presence of NOx, that we see the reduction of ROH, and then we see the enhancement of organic nitrate formation, and organic nitrate doesn't really contribute to ROS formation, so hence we see the reduction of um, ROS formation by SOA. So this is another sort of indication that um, organic hydroperoxide most likely generated by auto-oxidation and other processes is responsible for, for the formation of ROS by uh, SOA. 
And okay, so that was with water process. What about if it deposit in young wood? So we did experiments that uh, we extract actually the particles, the soil particles into salivate lung wood, meaning that um, the fluid containing lung antioxidants such as ascorbate, GSH, uric acid, and other lung antioxidants. And then we try to, to uh, quantify how much ROS is generated. This show the experimental results. Um, again, long story short, okay, so this is a, the data points is experiments and then lines are the model results that um, interestingly, we found lots of organic radical formation. So it seems that SOA, especially in the presence of ion ions, as the logox chemistry happens, and that leads accelerates the decomposition of organic hydroperoxide and organic peroxides, that leads to the formation of OH, O2 minus, and organic radicals. But um, OH and O2 minus is very reactive, so they are scavenged by antioxidants, so we didn't really detect it in, in the experiments. Uh, but then uh, organic radicals just uh, um, survive, and then that we, we detect. And uh, with this implementing this mechanism, we can also explain this experiment. The implication of this study is that maybe organic radicals might play also a role for photooxidative stress. We don't know. We don't know that um, whether new organic radicals are playing inducing oxidative stress or not. But now with this experiment, we know that organic radicals are generated in lung fluid. And um, this is still needs to be further investigated, the lower organic particles. And um, this is photochemistry. We also develop, I won't go, go quick, but uh, so we know it other species that is very reactive, and then that's uh, with photolysis, it can generate radicals. And then I just want to show that we have also a model to implement the photo, uh, photochemical processes to, to, to simulate uh, the radical formation. In this case, we did experiments with levoglucosan and benzoquinone, benzoquinone uh, mixtures to mimic the biomass burning aerosols, uh, because biomass burning aerosols often contain levoglucosan and quinones, and then quinones is very reactive, it is relux active, but also it undergoes photolysis and can generate uh, OH radicals, but also H dot radicals. And then if you get H dot radicals that may be active with dissolved oxygen to form HO2, um, so that uh, kind of radicals are generated and then we can, uh, we can simulate that also in the model. Okay, so that was all lab experiments. And then now I move on to put more to the ambient uh, particulate matters. So we do uh, the field particle sampling using high volume sampler and Moody. Um, we, did ex uh, we did sampling right next to the highway, very close to Disneyland. And then there's also in 2020, there are two big fires in Irvine. So we did the sampling um, during that wildfire season. And we also went to Fairbanks, Alaska as a part of our PACA campaign um, to, to investigate the toxicity of um, particulate matter in extremely cold and dark environments. And uh, the same story with the EPR measurements uh, for ROS, but also we also measure environmental persistent free radicals, EPFRs. This is a very stable radicals containing particulate matter, and it's like semi-quinone type radicals. Um, so we, we measure these, uh, these two properties. So this shows uh, the field measurements results. So in urban and highway, we see lots of OH radicals formation when we extract particles into water. And for wildfire, we, uh, we, we observe a variety of radicals, not just OH, but O2 minus and organic radicals. So it's, it seems it's more complicated. Um, so we are a bit surprised that we see exclusively OH radicals by highway PM. And we speculate it may be coming from non type emission because recently we did some experiments um, using the pure breakwear particles. We generated breakwear particles in the lab. Um, Jim Smith at UCI can generate that. So we uh, uh, analyze uh, that particles, breakwear particles, and we see exclusive formation of OH particles as shown in, shown in this figure. And we believe that's also um, um, generated by organic hydroperoxide generated during the break breaking. And that may be the source of uh, um, OH radicals. So, okay, so particles can generate different kinds of radicals. So how we can model that? Okay, so, uh, so that's the idea. So we know the chemistry happening in lung fluid. Okay, especially we know the chemistry, what's gonna happen when you have quinones 
or transition metal ions that would interact with some antioxidants that would reduce it, that reacts with of oxygen to form superoxide in young wood, and then that can be converted to H2O2 and OH radicals. So based on this chemistry, we developed a model, and then recently also expanded by Thomas Bergemeyer's group, even more, including more processes, but we now have a model, if we know the PM2.5 concentration, if we know the metal concentration, quinone concentration, then we can calculate how much you would inhale into your lung. Um, and then this chemistry will happen, and how much ROS would you get in, in your lung? Okay, so this shows the result. So this x-axis is PM2.5 ambient concentration, and we are seen two hours of exposure in outdoor. All right, and then this shows the ROS concentration. Y axis shows the estimated ROS concentration in your lung fluid. Okay, it's very difficult to measure ROS in lung fluid. I don't think it's, it's possible, but there are some measurements that medical people measured ROS concentration in lavage and then um, quantify ROS. And they found that healthy people usually have ROS concentration below 100 nanomolar in your lung. And respiratory disease patients and smokers, okay, it's one of the reasons why smoking is bad. Smokers have higher ROS concentration in lung fluid. Okay, and then here what we calculated is analyzing the different series of PM2.5 and then get, taking some um, metal concentrations. We calculated what would be the ROS concentration in your lung. And, and then the, the, this is a result you see that. As we expect, the higher the PM2.5 concentration, you have more metals, you have more relax active components. So the ROS concentration goes up, you see. And then you see this big range, and the EPA 24 hour standard is 75 microgram per cubic meter. It shows a range. So this book basically shows that PM2.5 inhalation can push up your ROS concentration to the level of respiratory disease patients, meaning that most likely oxidative stress can be induced. Um, so, so this is a model tool that we developed, and we now apply this um, with in collaboration with epidemiologists Scott Bikenthal and McGill and Michael Jarrett in UCLA. They have a network measurements in Toronto and Los Angeles. They give us a lot of data of metal measurements. So we use that metal concentration, calculating ROS concentration in each network point, and then they put that estimated ROS concentration in lung into epidemiological model. And then they found, I didn't expect this, but they found ROS is the most correlated with respiratory disease, cardiovascular disease, and COVID, and also adverse first outcomes, allergenic diseases in children in Los Angeles. Many things they found that ROS score is the most, more than like NO2 or ozone or individual iron or copper concentration. So it's very promising that it looks like oxidative stress does you play a role um, for, for the new adverse health outcomes. Um, and I want to touch on oxidative potential because many people measure oxidative potential as sort of a toxicity of particles. But the big question is what this oxidative potential really means because oxidative potential people usually measures with DTT, but you don't have DTT in your lung. And the DTT assay is assuming that DTT decay is corresponding to that formation. And um, so we try to evaluate that with field measurements and with also the model. Long story short, it's complicated. Sometimes we say correlation, for example, in this high level, we correlation, but why is we didn't see any correlation? So it seems very complicated topic. Sometimes it might work, sometimes not. And it's, this is still a, a topic of, of more research. But then for our target campaign in the pair banks, we, did, we got the very promising results that we found that EPFR, which is a very stable radical contained in uh, uh, particles, correlate really well with OH formation in lung fluid. This measurements by the only wavelengths group and with a very high correlation. So we are thinking maybe EPFR can be another indicator of toxicity, but uh, again, more research is, is necessary. And my time is up, but I want to mention one more thing that, that the macrophages play a role in ROS formation too. And with experiments, we found that when macrophages are activated, when it's exposed to high dose of isoprene SOA or, or, or quinones, then it's really this high amount of O2 minus and the overwhelming chemistry. But um, this is this overwhelming chem uh, or, or, or ROS happens only when uh, the, the dose is high. So chemistry is, I think, still important, but uh, um, this process needs to be conserved. 
So with that, uh, I, I finished my talk and um, I mean, model C needs to be improved. Our model, um, I think that it's, it's just such a complex system. So uh, more chemistry with other antioxidants needs to be included, more cellular processes, enzymes, and also synergistic effects by other pollutants needs to be included. Um, yeah. With that, I acknowledge my group and the collaborators, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thanks for the great talk. Um, I was curious if you take all of your laboratory systems and the ROS formed in all of those, and you try to reconstruct like an ambient total PM 2.5 ROS, do you get ROS closure? And that, that would be that would be great to do, but I, we haven't done that. Yeah. Yeah, because ambient PM is such a complex mixture, but if we can identify um, the low active components, that would be a good thing to do. I have one. I, you know, I didn't catch all of it, but um, you were, you talked about this distinction between the wildfire and, and other PM. Did you have any other any other thoughts or, or what might be going on with wildfire PM or what the implications might be of that difference? I, I it was going fast. So I didn't. You missed. Yes. Mention. So wildfire, it seems enormously complicated with lots of also insoluble components, and then it also contains lots of metals, and then so. Maybe we are speculating maybe some insoluble components also might contribute to ROS formation by surface processes, but this is just speculation. Thanks, thanks. All right, our next speaker is Dr. Ben Murphy. Uh, ben Murphy is a uh, research scientist at the US EPA in the Office of Research and Development. He develops algorithms uh, for modeling aerosols in the community multi-scale air quality model. Uh, and today I'll be talking about reactive organic carbon emissions related to uh, residential wood combustion processes. All right, thank you for the introduction and uh, thank you for the opportunity to discuss um, some of the work and thoughts that we've been um, going through with respect to uh, emission factors from residential wood burning um, emissions and, and the impact that they have on air quality in the wintertime in the United States. Um, so residential wood burning is a significant contributor, of course, to PM emissions, to carbon monoxide emissions, and to VOCs, both toxics and precursors to secondary PM and, and ozone. In fact, if we look at the uh, NEI published by EPA, in terms of anthropogenic emissions of PM 2.5, uh, residential wood burning contributes about 20% of the total. Um, if we look at VOCs, it's about 5%. And you know some important things to point out that make this this sector really challenging to think about and to work with is that you know we have fuel um, fuel species that are varying across the country. This can introduce a lot of uncertainty. Uh, operating conditions and moisture conditions vary in terms of of you know their effects on emissions. And then what I want to talk about today are the potential systematic biases that can be introduced from the way that we run standard test methods and the way that we interpret them, and how this can be connected to chemical composition for these emissions. So if you have a, a wood stove and you're trying to measure the emissions out of it, you can report, uh, measure and report those emissions using a couple of different methods for PM. Um, we rely on methods 5H and 5G, which, uh, which use glass fiber filters. Um, method 5H uses an impinger as well, and method 5G uses dilution tunnel. The point is they're trying to cool these emissions down to, you know, kind of ambient relevant temperatures uh, very quickly. And they do a very good job of that. But they also um, kind of concentrate the, um, the emissions to very high organic aerosol concentrations. And because of that, a lot of SVOCs and IVOCs can condense on these filters. And these are um, compounds that probably wouldn't be condensed to the, the particle phase at, under ambient conditions. So that's something that we need to um, be, able to, be able to think through and be able to correct for. On the VOC side, there's two different methods that are commonly used, uh, methods 25A and TO15. Uh, 25A is an inline method, so you just send the emissions into a flame ionization detector or an FID, and before that FID, you put a filter, glass fiber filter, to catch particles on their way into the FID to kind of protect it from, um, from those compounds and kind of separate those out. But that filter is heated to 110 Celsius to prevent a kind of water condensation in that line. Um, Alternatively, method TO15 uh, catches emissions in a sumo canister or a T-bar bag and then uh, measures those compounds offline in a, a GC FID. So in both of these methods, you can have losses in the line or in the sumo canister or T-bar bag, but also the FID itself is known to be undercounting oxygenated compounds, which is not such a big deal for you know, some sources like milk sources where you don't have a lot of oxygenated compounds, but for wood burning, you have a ton of them. And so you can end up undercounting 
um, both the oxygenated carbons in the in the sample, but also any of the non-carbon atoms are going to go completely undetected, such as oxygens and hydrogens, et cetera. So you have to think about that when, when interpreting in-log uh, measurements made with either of these two methods, and that's not something that's really traditionally thought about when well, these emission factors are being used in the inventories. So the goal of, of what we're thinking about right now is to determine if we can, you know, figure out how well these methods are actually accounting for the total reactive organic carbon from wood burning emissions. And if we can get some kind of sense of that, how can we translate the kind of operational metrics that are represented by these PM and VOC uh, measurements into something that's more standard and more kind of aligned and compatible with what we're doing in the air quality modeling side. Okay. So we're gonna uh, leverage the reactive organic carbon framework or ROC. And this basically just says, you know, you mix, uh, you want to consider everything in the particle and gas phase, regardless of its volatility. And you can see the kind of volatility basis set continuum that's kind of superimposed here as a function of volatility. Um, there are all these different uh, shaded green boxes here. And if we think about where the OM and, and MMOG emission factors are sitting in volatility space, the OM emission factors should be characterizing very low volatility stuff, um, but with some uncertainty in the SVOC and IVOC region, depending on the operating, the operating conditions of the test. NMOG, on the other hand, of course, is getting our VOCs, but also maybe capturing IVOCs or SVOCs, depending on the analysis technique. And what we would like to do is um, propose use in the field of some standard metrics. We're proposing uh, CROC, or condensable reactive organic carbon, and GROC, or gaseous reactive organic carbon. And the idea is that they will be aligned with low volatility and higher volatility material, with the cutoff between them exactly consistent with the, the cutoff between SVOCs and IVOCs in the VBS space. So the idea is that instead of just having particle phase material in the OM and, and gaseous and NMOG, you'll put both particle and gaseous material in each one of these metrics, but the cutoff will be at an actual com, uh, intensive chemical property. Now, the question is, how can we translate all the data that we already have going into inventories and, and published measurements um, to go from OM emission factors to CROC and NMOG emission factors into this, this CROC metric? So, We've gone back to a study from more than 20 years ago from, from Caltech. So Jamie Shower and Chris Nolte published work on uh, plant smoke in a fireplace, and they were able to speciate 226 different species in both the particle and gas phases. So this is among the data sets that we feel like we have the most speciation information from when we're thinking about kind of a wood burning uh, situation, wood burning source. Even in this case, uh, still 8% uh, of the uh, NMOG was unresolved and 60% of the particle phase mass was unresolved. So we're still not all the way there even with this data set, but this is the most complete that, that we could find. So we took each of the uh, speciated emission factors, predicted a vapor pressure from them, used it to calculate a saturation concentration to put it in this volatility basis set space. And here you can see the distribution of those emissions from all the way from ELVOCs up to VOCs. We had to figure out what to do with the unspeciated stuff against, you know, 68% or, or was like 30% or so of the, the total mass. So we assigned it in these, in these blue bars, kind of consistent with some volatility profiles that we had measured in the EPA lab for residential wood burn stoves, uh, wood burning stoves. Um, but then, of course, there's a lot of uncertainty in, in where we put this. So we undertook a, a Monte Carlo simulation with a thousand runs or so. Uh, and varied systematically the amount of emission factor in each one of these uh, volatility bins, and also varied the O to C assumed for each one of these. Uh, we tried with more than a thousand runs, but it kind of leveled off in terms of uh, variability, so we kept it about a thousand. What we found is if we looked at the temperature response of this, um, this kind of composition of emissions in terms of its mass fraction remaining under, under conditions relevant for a, a wood burning experiment, um, it was giving the same kind of temperature profile that was seen and reported by May et al. in 2013 for biomass burning emissions from the uh, flame study. So we felt confident that where we put these emissions in volatility space um, was reflecting, you know, what we kind of know about biomass burning emissions in general. Okay, so now what we're going to do is take this really detailed profile that we've constructed and use it to predict how much OM and NMOG would be measured for the different methods that I showed before. Then we can just add up the amount of CROC and GROC in our system and figure out what the conversion factor is to get from OM to CROC and NMOC to CROC. So focusing on GROC first, um, under an axis of organic aerosol concentration going from very concentrated conditions, these are milligrams per cubic meter, 
So lab conditions over here, the dilution ratio of like 10 to 20, all the way to ambient conditions, we can see how the conversion factor to go from the OM that would be measured to our croc metric would change with concentration. And as we would expect, at very highly concentrated conditions, we have uh, correction factors that go below one because there's a lot of IVOC on that filter that needs to be kind of um, subtracted off in order to get to our croc metric. And then as we go to ambient conditions, that scale factor increases because a lot of the SVOCs will be breaking through the filter uh, hypothetically. So at these concentrated lab conditions, we see factors of about 0.77 to 0.72, depending on the method that we, that we pick. Moving to the, the VOC and, and the Grok side, for method TL15, again, this is this offline method where we've collected the stuff and then measured it with a GC fit. Um, experiments on mobile sources found that these offline methods were good at capturing the VOCs, but IVOCs were getting lost in the, in the canisters. And so we're going to use that information to assert that um, the IVOCs were missing from, from method TO15, and then we can do a temperature independent correction. Um, so it will just be taking into account how much VOC was, was actually measured and scaling up. For the inline method for 25A, things get a lot more complicated. So I showed you before the temperature response curve, and you'll notice that when we go from, um, from low temperature to 110 Celsius, about 80% or so of the material that would have been in the particle phase is predicted to evaporate. Well, in this, in this situation on land, a lot of that will be breaking through the filter, assuming the equilibrium, and making it into the fig, which will drive up the apparent, um, the apparent uh, concentration of inbound that we've measured. On the other hand, if we look as a function of O to C ratio, so we go out to more oxygenated compounds, their relative equivalent carbon number is measured by the FID will actually go down as we would expect. And so this relationship was published by uh, Gabe Isaacman and Wurtz's group. And we're gonna use that applied to our detailed profile to figure out what the temperature dependent curve would be for a correction to go from the FID and mod to, to Grok. And so when we think about method TO15, we get a scale factor of about three, for method 25A, it varies from 1.8 at low temperature up to um, about 1.6 at 110 C. But then we started, then we did a lot of digging. So then we went through the, um, the NEI and looked up all the references for the emission factor data that was underlying uh, the emissions experiments that were underlying emission factor data for each one of these subsectors uh, for the wood, for the wood burning sector and figured out what the conditions were for each of those tests and then what methods they were using, and then use that to figure out how we would convert from the kind of NEI style NMOG and OM emission factors into our new kind of rock-based croc and rock emission factors. And here you can see um, across all of these subsectors, we're increasing the total rock by a, somewhere between 32 and 56%, depending on the individual subsector that's considered. But the total kind of condensable relevant stuff, the croc, is lower in all cases than the original OM. Um, there will still be evaporation under kind of ambient conditions of let's say like 20, 25 C or so. Um, and so there will be further decreases with this unless it's, unless it's very cold outside, which it often is when you're running a wood burning stove. We wanted to see with all of these complexities, everything that's trading off back and forth, um, what would happen in a realistic kind of um, realistic scenario. So we ran CMAC for the winter campaign in January through March of 2015. Uh, this has been simulated previously uh, by Geoschem, and they found that they had good performance compared to the AMS factors that were pulled out of the PMF analyses there, um, especially after they decreased the total POA in the 2011 NEI that they used by 50%. Um, so we're going to go back and use the EPA Air Quality Time Series projects where equates. Uh, these are emissions that are specific for 2015. This has been uh, released just in the last uh, two years, I think. Um, and we're, we undertook three different cases. So we simulated um, organic aerosol with the carbon bond six mechanism and non volatile PLA. Then we introduced um, a new mechanism that uh, is currently available in CMAC, the Community Regional Atmospheric Chemistry Multiphase Mechanism, uh, or CRACM. And we simulated two different simulations with this mechanism, one with semi volatile PLA consistent with uh, the May et al. 2013 volatility distribution and one with our new rock-based emission factors and, and detailed speciation. And these, these maps just show the uh, flights that were um, flown for the winter campaign. These are liver glucosan measurements um, in the early part of the campaign and the later part of the campaign, just to give you a sense for, for where this was all over the Eastern United States. 
In terms of organic aerosol in the total, we found for our rock-based simulation, a good agreement throughout um, the altitude that the, the plane was flying and measuring. Um, when we look at our three different cases, non-volatile PLA tends to over-predict near the surface and then perhaps under-predict in the middle to upper parts of the boundary layer. Uh, the semi-volatile PLA um, simulation tends to predict right on for the residential wood combustion organic aerosol near the surface and then under-predict over the loft. And our new rock-based simulation is kind of in between, slightly over-predicts near the surface, slightly under-predicts further up. We then wanted to go just one step further and think about uh, source apportionment, kind of put this in context. So when we think about what CMIC is predicting for residential wood compared to other major sources of organic aerosol in the wintertime, um, we can compare reswood on the, the top left here to estimates for VCPs in the top right, mobile on the bottom left, and point fire emissions are really just prescribed fires in the bottom right. And reswood is dominating uh, over the other sectors. Mobile and VCPs, interestingly, are very similar on average, but spatially look very different. If we look at uh, the, the contribution of each of these sectors to total organic aerosol as a fraction and look at it across as a function of population, we see interestingly that, that the res wood combustion um, emissions are contributing with a peak somewhere between kind of densely populated suburban areas and kind of more lesser populated urban areas, and then kind of trail off as we go to, to more rural locations. Okay, so that's all I've got. Um, we propose new emission factors based on a detailed look at speciation and biases that may be apparent in, um, in the EPA emissions measurement methods uh, that had the effect of increasing total rock by 30 to 50%. And this mass is potentially missing from the NEI. Um, this gets us you know, an average wood burning away prediction at the surface of about 1.1 micrograms per cubic meter for the winter time. Um, and perhaps we're essentially unchanged because we're increasing the total rock, but also adding in IBOCs. Now, I also lied, this isn't actually everything I have. One more slide. Um, so it's also come to my attention that there's an, an, another complexity that we hadn't really appreciated before, although we kind of knew it was there, that in between actually collecting these filters and making the measurement, um, they are allowed to off-gas for one to five days before actually being weighed. And so the, of course, material can be coming off as it's being designed to do, and that's going to be dependent on volatility. And so now we have a problem of, you know, different lifetimes be expected of, of compounds within the volatility space, which would also be dependent on the thickness of the layer of material that is on the filter. So we're trying to make sense of what that means now. So thanks very much. Great talk, Ben. Um, I have a few questions. I'll just ask one. Um, so when you're evaluating, you're evaluating against vertical profiles, and I thought that was interesting to evaluate against vertical profiles for emissions, though then I was thinking, oh yeah, you're thinking about the temperature dependence, but do you think with that mid-tropospheric underestimation across all three approaches, is that like just indicative of like lack of aqueous SOA chemistry or like missing or, or too much wet deposition during synoptic lofting or those sorts of things? It seemed like there could be a lot of yeah. Uh, so my first bet before I would blame aqueous chemistry um, or interrogate aqueous chemistry, my first guess is it has to do with um, basically our mixing model that you've got boundary layer heights that are kind of in between what 500 meters and and maybe somewhere around 2,000 meters for the winter time, and you know that's kind of where we see this. So I suspect it's just you know boundary layer height uncertainties plus the way that we're mixing near that height. Plus, most of these emissions, of course, are happening at night, which is harder. I have one just to clarify. So this update had a pretty big impact on emissions. And then when you did your 3D simulation, it like it didn't break anything. The performance seems to be pretty good or in the same ballpark. And I'm wondering, like, broadly, if you've done other simulations and to whatever extent there's top down constraints and that if you make a huge change of emissions and things just go off the rails, you'd know hey, something's off here, but but basically you're making a scientific improvement to the emissions, emissions go up, and what you're seeing in all these evaluations is it's as consistent as you'd expect. Is, is that the right interpretation overall? Or you wanna... That's definitely still the interpretation of the data that I'm showing here. Um, so, you know, these comparisons are for these measurements, right? So it's not, you know, it's not capturing a lot of what's happening in the upper Midwest, like in Minnesota, Wisconsin, where we expect to see a lot of wood burning emissions. Um, and it's not capturing, you know, further up into New York and into the Northeast where we expect to see a lot as well. Um, so it's, 
I think kind of imperfect as a end all be all constraint on what's happening with wood burning and our modeling from that perspective, but it's the best that I kind of we had to go with for now. Um, and then for kind of this comparison, well, this isn't, this is just kind of looking at a snapshot. So any kind of high level, this is what's happening domain wide is also probably too large to get kind of that nuance like difference between the different modeling cases. So I guess the answer is you know, we're still on the hunt for um, what the right kind of scale of comparison is and how that matches up with, you know, important exposure metrics. Thanks. All right, so uh, at this point, uh, we would like to start uh, kind of introducing some of our personal presenters for the reception later. Uh, so we will start with the lightning talks. Uh, and I'm asking uh, all of you who have submitted lightning talk slides to please come forward here and line up along the wall. And then each of you will have about one minute uh, and one slide to advertise your poster uh, that we will be having a chance to watch later. There are about 21 posters, I think, overall. Uh, not all of you have uh, submitted a lightning talk, so it's probably more like 15 or so. All right. Uh, ahoy, everybody. My name is Thomas Bergmeier. I'm group leader at the Max Planck Institute for Chemistry. And I would like to invite all of you uh, on the bold endeavor. The task is going to be telling an experimentalist what to do by designing their next experiment. So. Um, uh, to navigate these deep waters, my group, or much rather um, a PhD student in my group, Matteo Krüger, he designed an algorithm that finds the best conditions for the next experiment, and it creates such a map. And um, yeah, to navigate um, this uh, such a map in atmospheric uh, chemistry and atmospheric sciences is quite difficult. Not because air is much more dense than water, or uh, much less dense than water, or experimentalists are much more dense than water, but um, because the experimental conditions that we can access in the laboratory are much different from the atmospheric conditions sometimes, right? So and if you want to um, learn more about this, about this technique, why the X of the treasure map is in the top right corner, if you want to learn about Julia as a programming language which we use for this project, or if you're just offended by what I just said, please visit me at my poster. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, our next presenter is uh, Kamtung Chen. Testing. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kamtung Chen from UC Davis. Today, I would like to share a work uh, about molecular modeling of natural photosynthesis in aqueous solution. So we know that nitrogen oxides NOx, is a, one of the major air pollutants in the atmosphere. So one of the major sink of NOx is the oxidation of NOx into uh, nitrate anion in aqueous aerosols and particulate surfaces. So the community has suggested that the renoxification, which is the photosynthesis of nitrate, can reproduce NOx back to the atmosphere. So the photosynthesis of nitrate can proceed into two channels, uh, proceeding NO2 or nitrate anion. And experiments has, just, has suggested that the quantum yields of both channels are around 1% at room temperature. So in this work, we are trying to answer and to reveal the origin or the causes of these low quantum yields. And we discovered a solvation cage complex, which is metastable and which allows the, uh, the photofragments to be combined to each other or deactivate through non-radiative processes. So I'm, so I will, I'm welcome to, um, to listen or to ask any further questions about the modeling and the chemistry of this photosynthesis. Thank you. The next post of uh, ad is by uh, Jeff Curtis. Uh, hello, I'm Jeff Curtis from the University of Illinois. Uh, my poster is investigating the structural uncertainty that is introduced due to uh, making mixing state assumptions regarding aerosol representation. So uh, imagine you have a size distribution, and you have a mass distribution, and you manage to preserve this, but you can distribute the species and the particles quite differently, right? So on the left here, I have a modal approach, which most people are very familiar with. We have three modes and each mode is fully internally mixed. So all the particles in each mode look exactly the same. Then on the right here, we have our particle result approach, which serves as a benchmark for uh, aerosol uh, mixing state, where we don't make any such assumptions regarding how the aerosols are uh, distributed. And what we can do is we can take these two different particle populations that have identical bulk properties like size distribution and mass distribution, 
and we can calculate CCN concentrations and optical properties, and then we can compare the two, and we can see that they're actually quite different. And uh, if you want to see more about this, you can visit my poster. Thank you. Uh, the next presentation is by Song Ching Chiang. Hello, I'm Zhong Jin Zhang from Brookhaven National Lab, and my topic is about uh, a model driven system co design. You know, improvements in climate model predictability are always hampered by limited feedback between reducing model uncertainty and designing optimal observing systems. Observations are frequently used to enhance model performance, but process models are rarely used to uh, guide measurement deployment. So we develop a novel computational framework to address these challenges. The framework uh, comprises model simulation, statistical emulation, uncertainty quantification, and optimal experimental design. By implementing this under the hood software architecture, we expect the transition between model and observation can be as straightforward as flipping a switch. Please stop by my poster if you want to know more details. Thank you. Thank you. The next uh, presentation is by Chia Chiang. Hello, I'm Jia from UC Davis. Many of you may know that California is the largest dairy producer in the nation, and it contributes to a significant amount of massing like um, emission in the United States. Um, so there are quite a few like dairy control technologies have been adopted in California, uh, such as the dairy digester. Um, which can convert uh, manure uh, to biogas to uh, generate electricity and uh, effectively remove um, uh, reduce uh, mass emissions. Um, however, there are quite a few discussions and arguments about um, the environmental impacts of these digesters. So in our work, we try to use a 3D air quality model and try to produce a high resolution uh, exposure fields for the San Jose Valley and try to understand its environment, uh, try to understand its air quality and health impacts. So if you are interested in this topic, please come by my poster and we have, can have more discussions. Thank you. Thank you. The next presentation is by Regina Lu. I'm Regina Lu from UC Irvine, and I'll be presenting on global simulations of SOA phase state with GeoSchem. So our primary findings is that at the surface level, SOA phase, um, SOA is more um, phase states generally correspond to relative humidity patterns, but as we go up in altitude, a mass away is more likely to be found in the semi-solid to solid phase. Um, we also calculated equilibration time scales with a, a process-level multilayer um, model called KMGAP, and we calculate um, and we find that for SOA, especially in the Western United States, Northern Africa, and Western China, the SOA does not equilibrate within the 20 minute chemical time step of GeoSchem. So if you'd like to know more about these results, come see my poster. Thank you. Uh, the next presenter is Manuel Park. Not, not here? Oh. Okay. Hello, my name is Manu Park. Um, my poster is about developing a direction server, which is using convolutional neural network to emulate the numerical server. So I uh, made a convolutional neural net based server, which is accepting scalar concentration and CFR number, and then predicting flux at the edge of the numerical grid so that we can have faster server than numerical direction server. And how much is fast? Um, you will see. So now on the right. Okay, so the next presentation is by Karin Sartlet. Hello, I'm uh, Karin from uh, Syria in France. So um, we have been investigating the studying soil formation at uh, regional and street scale over Paris and trying to, um, to find out uh, how the representation of the chemical schemes 
affect the compounds and the tolerance to formation. So we have been reducing um, different um, Tolerant uh, SOS schemes using uh, Genoa. So Genoa will be presented to you in details tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. by Gija. So please come to see her. And um, and we have been reducing schemes ba based on the master chemical mechanism and different um, versions of uh, of master chemical mechanisms with additions, for example, of um, highly oxygenated organic molecules formation. And we put that in the aerosol model and then in the regional scale and street scale model. And then we compare uh, the total SOA formations and uh, we find a similar total SOA concentrations with the two schemes, but uh, we find that we had more um, holds uh, contribution at the street scales and at the regional scale. So please come to discuss if uh, that interests you. Uh, the next presentation is by Meredith Shervish. Hello, everyone. I'm Meredith. I'm a postdoc at UCI, and uh, my work I'm presenting today is focused on using a kinetic multilayer model KM gap to simulate mixing time scales of different SOA populations. And so we do this by setting up this uh, model where we have two populations with a semi-volatile species that's present initially in one population and mixing occurs via transport of that species to the other. And then we vary the properties of that semi-volatile species as well as the particle bulks in order to get at when that mixing time scale is fast enough where we're representing that well in large scale models that often assume rapid mixing. And so the results are that these time scales are prolonged when the populations are more viscous at the extremes of volatility and when uh, the semi-volatile species is favorably miscible in the second population. So if you'd like a justification for any of that, you can come see me, or if you'd like to just talk SOA VBS stuff, it's my favorite conversation topic, just come by. Thanks, Meredith. Uh, our last uh, lightning talk presenter is uh, Siegfried Schöbesberger. Hello, I'm Siegfried Schöbesberger, University of Eastern Finland, and my poster is on uh, simulating the thermal disruption of filter-collected organic aerosol uh, for chemical ionization mass spectrometry. Um, you see on the upper right here an uh, electron microscopy picture of such a filter. It's a, a Teflon membrane filter. Um, and you can see that uh, in this case, it has polyethylene glycol particles collected on it, and those particles are then heated uh, by nitrogen. And as they evaporate, we measure so-called thermograms. You can see in the, on the left part of this slide where the, the polyethylene glycols um, evaporate sequentially with the smaller, higher volatility glycols dissolving first and the, the lower volatility uh, guys later. And then the model simulations are fit to this data. The model simulations are in orange, the orange lines, um, by, by fitting the uh, vapor pressure or C star, uh, which basically shifts these thermograms uh, left and right, and by the vaporization enthalpy delta H, which uh, adjusts the slope of these th model thermograms. So that's basically what the model is about. And on the poster, I go a bit uh, more into depth and, in, and uh, discuss. Um, how aerosol and instrumental setup parameters affect the results, how to deal with these, in principle, unphysical tails of the thermograms, how and why and when to fit thermal decomposition processes into these thermograms as well. And then I have some stuff on level glucosan, my new favorite compound at the moment. Thanks. All right, thanks all the lightning talk presenters. Uh, so I guess this concludes uh, a lightning talk session. And of course, now you know which process you wanna go see first, as well as all the others. And they cover the whole range of topics that we have here at the IAMA conference. <laughs>